say a word so many times that it starts to sound funny. The scene, I think, I can't remember which movie it is. It's with David Spade and Chris Farley, and they're just driving in a car, and they keep saying the word fork. You know what movie that is? Is that Black Sheep, or is it something like that? But keep saying the word fork, 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 and it just starts. If you say any word enough times, it just starts to be weird, and you say, what is that? Why is it like that? Or do you ever hear a word said so many times and used so many times by tons of people, and you just think, does anyone know what that word actually means? And I, I love this scene in The Princess Bride. If you've seen The Princess Bride, you're going to track with this. If you haven't, you're just silly that you haven't seen that movie. It's fantastic. Um, but there's this guy named Inigo Montoya, you know, guy, six-fingered man killed his dad, prepared to die, all that. But there's this one guy that keeps saying the word inconceivable. Like, every two minutes, he says the word inconceivable, and Inigo Montoya finally goes, he's a Spaniard, and he goes, you keep using that word. <laughs> but I don't, I don't think it means what you think it means. Because <laughs> he just keeps saying, inconceivable. <clears throat> he goes, I, I don't think it means what you think it means. And honestly, I think that's, um, for the church today, I think that's what the word grace is. I think that word grace is a word that we use a ton. It's thrown around a lot in the church, in Christianity at large. But I think, like an ego Montoya, you just kind of want to say to people, you keep saying that word. I don't think it means what you think it means. I don't, we, we hear it used in so many different contexts. If you ask 10 different people, you will probably get 10 different definitions of what grace means. So today I'm excited to dig into the word. We're going to, this is our last week in the book of Genesis, chapter 45. So if you got a Bible or you got a phone, grab it, get there. Genesis 45, verses 1 through 15. That's our text today that the sermon will be based on. And I think this story is a vivid picture of grace. This story is a vivid picture of what grace looks like in action and even what the definition of grace is. So, a little bit of context what's going on. Joseph was a pretty big jerk. And God had blessed him a lot, but he was a jerk, and he was arrogant, he was prideful to his brothers. So his brothers didn't like him, and they threw him in a pit. They stripped this beautiful robe off him that his dad had given him, stripped him naked, threw him in a pit, abandon him to death, and then they end up selling him into slavery. Their own brother. They sell him into slavery, and then Joseph goes off into slavery, and he ends up, through God's sovereignty, through all this providence, all these things happen, and Joseph ends up being the prime minister in Egypt. Egypt was the like epicenter of the world at this time. This is the kingdom, Egypt. And Joseph becomes second in command, the prime minister there. And then a great famine comes across the whole world, or this whole area of the world, and everyone's starving except Egypt, because Joseph had had a dream that there was going to be a seven-year famine, but before that there was going to be seven years of plenty, so Joseph says, let's save up, let's stock up all this food. So they do it, and Egypt's got all the food, everyone else is starving, and so Joseph's brothers, who have no idea what happened to him, they have no idea he rose to power in Egypt, they are starving, and they've got to go to Egypt because they heard there's food there, and they've got to go before the prime minister to ask for food for their family. They have no idea that it's their brother. And so they come in, and they're asking. It's kind of a long story, but this is where we pick up in Genesis 45. They come to ask him for food, and then Joseph reveals himself to his brothers, says, I'm your brother you sold into slavery. So that's the context of what's going on, Okay. We're going to see how Joseph responds to his brothers when he just says, it's me. So Genesis 45, uh, starting with verse 1, we're going to go through verse 15. This is the word of God. Then Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood by him. He cried, make everyone go out from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept aloud, so that the Egyptians heard it, and the household of Pharaoh heard it. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed at his presence. So Joseph said to his brothers, Come near to me, please. And they came near, and he said, I'm your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves, because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. 
For the famine has been in the land two years, and there are yet five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on the earth, and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh, and lord of all his house, and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not tarry. You shall dwell in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near me, you and your children and your children's children, and your flocks, your herds, and all that you have. There I will provide for you, for there are yet five years of famine to come, so that you and your household and all that you have do not come to poverty. And now your eyes see, and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see, that it is my mouth that speaks to you. You must tell my father of all my honor in Egypt, of all that you have seen. Hurry and bring my father down here. Then he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept. And Benjamin wept upon his neck, and he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. After that, his brothers talked yes. This is the word of the Lord. So I think if we really dig into this text, we're going to see four things, and these are the things I'm going to point you to. First of all, we're going to see the definition of grace. What does that word mean? What does grace look like? And then we're going to see kind of what grace looks like in action. We're going to see the gentleness, the refuge, and the power of grace. So I've got the definition, the gentleness, the refuge, and the power of grace in this story. Ready? Number one, definition of grace. Grace is a word that's used a whole lot in the Bible, about 170 times. There's 66 books in the Bible, 170 times the word grace is used. That's just the word. The theme of grace is just the whole story. That is the Bible. We mess everything up by our sin. God rescues us by his grace. But like I said, I think if you ask 10 people, you're going to get 10 different definitions of what the word grace actually means. I was talking to a friend of mine just a little bit a few months ago, and God has really grown them a lot in the last year or two. And they were talking about this, how much Jesus has just opened their eyes to stuff and to his grace and what that actually means. And they had said that, you know, I grew up in church and I've heard that word a lot, but I just kind of thought grace meant forgiveness. You know, like we don't deserve it, but then we get forgiven and Jesus forgives us. And that's what grace means. <coughs> and forgiveness is a part of grace, but that's not the totality of what grace actually means. And in this story, we get a vivid picture of it. So read this, read verses 4, 9, and then 10 through 11 again. And just notice these things. It's up on the screen, but you can read it in your own Bible. So Joseph said to his brothers, come near to me, please. And they came near. And he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. Verse 9, come down to me. Verse 10, you shall dwell in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near me. You and your children and your children's children and your flocks, your herds, all that you have, there I will provide for you. For there are yet five years of famine to come, so that you and your household and all that you have do not come to poverty. So Joseph shows his brothers grace, and I want you to notice something. He forgives them, yes. See that? He, he just flat out says, let's get straight to it. I'm your brother Joseph, whom you sold into slavery whom you sold into Egypt. And then immediately, he just leaves that, forgives them, says, is my dad still alive? You guys, come down here. You're going to die. Come down here. But I want you to see, Joseph doesn't just forgive them. Joseph also gives them favor. He also blesses them. See, grace is not just forgiveness. Grace is forgiveness plus favor. Think of it like this, like, because of our sin, because of our rebellion against God, Jesus owes us nothing but death and destruction. That's it. That's what you've earned. If you want to stand on anything of like, I want my just desserts, I want what I've earned, I want what's coming to me, death, hell, and the wrath of God. That's what you got. That's, what, that's all we've got. And so think of it like, because of that, we're at negative 100. Right? We deserve death, hell, the wrath of God. Because of our active rebellion against an infinitely holy and good God, we're at negative 100. Forgiveness brings us to zero. So we don't have to pay back all of the things that we should have to pay back. We don't have to 
go to hell. We don't have to pay for our sin, so we're to zero. That's forgiveness. But the good news of the gospel and the good news of the grace of God is that he doesn't just forgive us and bring us to zero. He forgives us, and then he gives us his favor, his blessing. He adopts us into his family. You know, the good news of the gospel is not just that God's not mad at you anymore if you're in Christ. The good news of the gospel is that God's not mad at you, zero, and he also actually likes you, plus 100. You're adopted into the family of God. You're called a son of God. The reason we're called sons, men and women are called sons, is because that carries with it this connotation of you are an heir. You have all the rights of the firstborn. So whether you're a man or a woman, you're called a son of God. You're also called children of God throughout the scripture. But women, when you read son of God, that we are sons of God, don't think it's like, why does it say children? The idea is that you get everything that the firstborn son should get. And that's the good news of grace, is that grace is not just forgiveness. Grace is forgiveness plus favor. You see that? You tracking with me? When we talk about grace, it's basically talking about we were as bad as it could get, and then the pendulum swings, and we have it as good as we could possibly get it. So the good news of God's grace, it's, it's seen here in how Joseph treats his brothers. I'm your brother who you sold into Egypt. Now come to me, and I'm going to provide for you, and I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to see that none of you go to poverty. I mean, this is nuts. The way Joseph responds to his brothers, I mean, this is not the way the world responds to this kind of stuff. So a few things I just want you to grab out of this. I want you to see that the definition of grace, an easy way to remember it, is that it's forgiveness plus favor. Forgiveness plus favor. We're adopted into the family of God through Jesus. He's not just not mad at us. He actually likes us and he treats us as a child. Ephesians chapter 2 captures this vision of grace very clearly. Ephesians 2, 1 through 10 is probably the, the best part in the entire Bible that helps us understand how bad off we were God's great grace to forgive us and then show us his great favor and kindness and love to us. Just, just read through this. Ephesians 2. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, and were by nature children of, what's that word? Uh, Wrath. Wrath. But God made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. So you've got wicked, wrath, then you've got, but God saved us. And then you keep moving, and he says, By grace you've been saved, and raised us up with him, that's Jesus, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. That's not just forgiveness. Do you see that? That's not just God's like, all right, I'll let you off the hook. Jesus paid for your sin. You don't have to go to hell. That's a... You're ransomed from where you should go. You should go to hell. You deserve that. You're ransomed from that, and I'm seating you with Jesus in the heavenly places so that in the coming ages, I mean, you see what this is saying? Paul's saying God is super pumped to show you the immeasurable riches of his kindness towards you in Jesus. That's the good news of the gospel, is that we're not just forgiven, but God actually loves us and shows his kindness to us, shows his grace to us, raises us up with Christ and seats us as an heir of God, as a son of God, as a child of God. He treats us as sons. It's not just something that we're called. He doesn't just call us children. We actually are children. The Apostle John says that, and I think it's First John. He says, we're not just called children of God. It is what we are. It is our legal status, children of God. So I want to zero in just on this definition of grace so that we really leave here understanding what grace means, and it's helpful to us. But like I've said, it's forgiveness plus favor. Get that? We're forgiven, and then we get favor. And then secondly, grace is always free and costly. Grace is always free and costly. Was it free for Joseph to forgive and show favor to his brothers. Was that free for Joseph? 
Not at all. I mean, he'd been thrown into a pit. He'd been stripped naked, thrown into a pit, sold into slavery. He ends up getting power, and then he uses that to give him grace. But it wasn't just free. He had to absorb that debt. He had to not take vengeance out on his brothers. How many of you go, if my family sold me into slavery and I rose to power, I don't think I would do what Joseph did. I think if a lot of us are honest, we'd say, that would be really tough. I would not want to do that. I would want to put them in slavery and they could be my slaves and work it back. That's not what Joseph does, though. So Joseph, in a sense, absorbs that debt. He's not going to avenge himself. Then he doesn't just do that. He says, come here. I've got money. I'm going to spend it. Come live in Goshen. That's near Egypt. He's saying, live in this fertile land. You can live on my property. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to provide for you. You are not going to go into poverty. See, grace is always costly for the one who gives it, but always free for the one who receives it. What did Joseph's brothers have to do to receive this grace? Nothing. They hadn't even said anything. If you look at this, the story, it doesn't say until like verse 15 that they even talked to him. He says, I'm Joseph. And they're just like, uh-huh. And then he says all this stuff to him, like, you sold me into slavery. And they're like, I see where this is going. And then he says, but I want you guys to come down to me. I'm going to give you a future. I'm going to provide for you. And then he starts weeping on them, and they're hugging and kissing each other, and then it says the brothers started to respond to him. They started to even talk. So we see that for those who were receiving grace, it's completely free. They did nothing. They didn't even grovel. They didn't, they didn't do anything but stand there and passively receive the grace that was being given to them. But you've got to see that grace is always free for the one who receives and incredibly costly for the one who gives. The greatest illustration of this idea that grace is free and costly is the cross. Was it free for Jesus to give us grace? No. He paid the highest cost. He went to the cross. God became a man. He put on flesh and blood. He got tired. He got sick. He was tempted in every way that we are, yet without sin. He then went to the cross and experienced the most brutal and horrific physical pain you could ever experience. And he experienced the most brutal and spiritual pain that you could experience. He was separated from God. He absorbed the wrath of God, the sin, the judgment of sin that you and I deserve and we've earned. Jesus did that to give us grace. It was incredibly costly for him. But what does it cost us? Nothing. Jesus says, it is finished. He says, come to me. He says, believe. I have finished the work. I've done everything necessary. You just receive it passively. You just say, I give up. It's you. So grace is always free for the receiver, always costly for the giver. The third thing that we see about grace and that you've just got to realize, it is completely upside down from the way of the world. Completely upside down. We, we speak of like grace as it being upside down, and maybe it's better to speak of it. Grace is actually right side up, and the world is upside down. But for the sake of us just thinking about it, from the way of the world, grace just doesn't make sense. What would you have done if you were in power? You're the, most, you're the second most powerful man in the most powerful nation in the world, and the people who had sold you into slavery, betrayed you, are before you, and you have their fate in your hands. I think some of us would have just killed them. I think some of us would have thrown them into slavery, had them pay it back. And then I think some of us would have said, you know what, I'm going to forgive you. Just get out of my sight. I'm not going to kill you. I'm not going to enslave you, but get out of my sight. But Joseph doesn't just do that. He says, I want you guys to come to me. I'm going to take care of you. I'm the Lord over Egypt, and I'm going to use that authority and power to save you and deliver you. Completely upside down. And we've got to realize that this is not the way the world works. Grace is so upside down that it makes sense that grace comes from outside of this world. Grace doesn't come from here. Grace came from outside. Jesus is the face of grace. 
you read John chapter 1, it says, from his fullness, from Jesus' fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. John says the word, that's Jesus, became flesh, became a man, and dwelt among us, and tabernacled with us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. The reason Jesus is just so counterintuitive to everything is because Jesus is grace. And the world can't handle that. The world can't handle when something like that happens. When someone actually shows someone else grace, not just forgiveness, but grace, it actually makes the headlines, usually. Grace is like you borrow your friend's car, and you get wasted, and you wreck it, and then your friend doesn't just not make you pay it back, but he actually buys you a new car. says, you can just keep this new one. What? It's not just forgiveness. It's forgiveness plus blessing, plus status, plus favor. It does not make sense. So when we think about grace, make sure that you understand we're not just talking about, oh, I'll let you go. It's I'll let you go, and I want to bring you near, and I'm going to take care of you forever. That's the definition of grace. The second thing that we see, we see what grace looks like in action. Not just the definition, but what it looks like in action. We see the gentleness of grace in this story. Read verses 1 through 4 with me. So his brothers are there. It says, Then Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood by him. And he cried, Make everyone go out from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers, and he wept aloud so that the Egyptians heard it, and the household of Pharaoh heard it. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed at his presence. So Joseph said to his brothers, Come near to me, please. And they came near, and he said, I'm your brother, Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. I imagine he whispered that to them. So Joseph has his brothers, and he's got this awesome opportunity. He's got all these Egyptians around him, all of his subjects, and he's the leader. What would you do with that? Hey, everyone, check this out. These are my brothers that sold me into slavery, and I'm going to forgive them. Look, everyone, how awesome I am and how wicked they are. He couldn't, he couldn't control himself, he said, so he says, he tells everyone, leave. Everyone leave. He's so gentle with his brothers and the way that he talks to them that I imagine they probably even took a few steps back and were like, oh my gosh, it's Joseph. And he says, so he said to them, because they couldn't even talk, come near to me, please. I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into slavery. He doesn't come to them and say, do you guys realize what you've done? Do you guys realize what you've put me through? Do you guys realize how evil you are? He just goes, it's true, you're evil. It's true, you sold me into slavery, but come near to me. Everyone else is sent away. He says, come near to me, and he starts talking with them. There's this scene in John chapter 20. After Jesus has lived perfect, righteous life, he died on the cross for our sin, paying for our sin, paying for hell, paying for the wrath of God. And then three days later, Jesus victoriously arose from death to eternal life as our Savior, as our Lord, as King. And then he comes and reveals himself to his disciples, to his 12 apostles, who had all betrayed him. They either ran away when he got arrested, or like Peter, they denied even knowing him. Then we see that Jesus appears to them. In John 20, it says that he appeared to most of them, and they were just dumbfounded. They were thunderstruck that Jesus is alive, but this guy named Thomas wasn't there. You guys have heard of Thomas, I'm sure. This guy gets a bad rap, doubting Thomas, right? Thomas is just like, is this actually true? But it says that they told Thomas, the Lord has appeared to us. Jesus is alive. And Thomas said, unless I see it, I won't believe it. So then they're all together, and it says the room was locked, and Jesus walks through the, 
wall. It says Jesus appeared among them. And Jesus has this moment with Thomas, and he just says, Hey, Thomas, come here. Look at my hands. Put your hand on my side. See that it's me. The way Jesus responds to Thomas and the disciples is, thankfully, that's how he responds to us. The way Joseph responded to his brothers in giving them grace and being so gentle. He doesn't shy away at the fact that they're great sinners, but he doesn't come and just destroy them. He says, yeah, I'm your brother you sold into slavery. Jesus comes to Thomas and says, Thomas, look at my hands. Look at the price. Look at the price I paid for your sin. It's me. I'm alive. I know you didn't believe it. Here's the proof. Put your hand on my side. See the high price that I paid. See how much I love you. See how much I sacrificed for you. He doesn't yell at him. He doesn't say, Thomas, you wicked unbeliever. You doubted when they told you I was alive. He says, you want proof? Here it is. And he gives Thomas grace. Jesus is never hard on someone who is struggling to believe. I said this last week, but I need to, we need to make this clear. Jesus is never hard on someone who's struggling to believe, who wants to believe, who's like, Shh, I, I want to see the proof. I want to see the evidence. Why do you believe the Bible? Why do you believe Jesus is who he says he is? Jesus is never hard on any of us who are struggling to believe. Jesus is only hard on those who refuse to believe. I want you to see just how gentle grace is. Grace doesn't just come and beat us into the ground. Grace is honest, though. It says, yeah, you, you are more wicked than you ever thought. I'm your brother who you sold into slavery. This is the price of your sin. But I paid that price so I could give you grace. That's what Jesus does to us. He's gentle. He comes to us. And we're told in Romans 2, 4, that it's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. The kindness of God leads us to repentance. It's not the brutality of God. It's not the judgment of God. It's not the fear of God that leads us to repentance. Paul says it's the kindness. It's the, yes, you are wicked. Yes, you deserve my wrath. And you'll get it unless you flee to Jesus. But look what Jesus has done. Look at my hands. Look at my side. It's true you're that bad. It's also true that you're that loved. Come near to me, please. Imagine sitting with Jesus like Thomas. Imagine Jesus just sitting down. And you're struggling to believe. You're struggling to really accept how bad you are and how much you need a Savior. And Jesus doesn't just stand up and like the room gets dark and he starts screaming at you. He sits down and he says, come here. This is the price. I paid it for you. <laughs> Don't shy away because you're scared of how bad you are. You are that bad. You've got to know it. But I'm this good that I'm delivering you from it. That I have done everything to bring you out of darkness into my light. That's the gentleness of grace. I think we need to really grab this and we need to realize Here's something to take home with you. This means that Jesus didn't come to bloody us up. Jesus came to be bloodied up for us. Jesus didn't come to just pierce us and say, look how evil you are there and there and there and there and there. And that's it. No, he says, yeah, look how evil you really are. Look how much you need me. Look how much I'm doing for you. <laughs> I think some of us, we've come to realize the depths of our sin. We've come to realize that what we have earned and what we deserve is the wrath of God because we've been living in rebellion to him. And my fear is that some of us just stay there. And we live as if God hasn't given us grace in Jesus. We live as if God exists just to bloody us up, to tell us how wicked we are. But Jesus didn't come to do that. Jesus says, I think it's in John 3, he says, I have not come to condemn the world. I've come to save the world. 
And then later in John, he says, I've come to condemn the world. You go, okay, what does that mean? I haven't come to condemn the world. I've come to save the world. And then later he says, I've come to condemn the world. Because we feel condemnation when Jesus exposes our sin, right? We feel like, I feel like he has come to condemn me because I feel condemned. What Jesus means when he says, I've not come to condemn the world. I've come to save the world. He's meaning I haven't come to namely just bring condemnation. That's not why I've come. My coming and my teaching and my revealing that your sin is that deep, it is condemning. But I've not come to do that. I've come to show you the weight of your sin and to deliver you from your sin. John Piper gives this great illustration that's always stuck with me about this fact that it's revealed just how evil we are. And it, we're tempted to think, Jesus came to reveal how evil I am. It feels like he came to condemn me. But he said, I've come to save you. And the illustration Piper uses, is, it says, imagine you're in World War II and you get your leg almost blown off. And the medic runs over to you and you know that your leg is a mess. And you look up to the medic and you say, have you come to cut my leg off? says, no, I've come to save your life. But I am going to have to cut your leg off to do it. That's what Jesus means when he says, I've not come to condemn you. I've come to save you. I've not come to cut your leg off, though I am going to have to cut it off. I've come to save your life. Jesus has come, and it, he reveals how evil we are, for sure. There's no getting around it. But it's in such a gentle way that Jesus hasn't come to condemn you. Jesus has come to show you that you're condemned without him and to deliver you from that condemnation. Jesus came to take the condemnation for you. And he just does it in a far gentler way than any of us would. Look how he responds to Thomas. Look how Joseph responds to his brothers. That's the gentleness of grace. third thing that we see is the refuge of grace. Look at verses 5 through 9. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. This is incredible. He just goes, oh, don't worry about that. God was in control of it all. Yeah, it was really evil, but God meant it for good. For the famine has yet been in the land these two years, and there are yet five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on the earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. Okay, so the sons of Jacob, let's pause right here. The sons of Jacob end up becoming the, the leaders, the heads of the 12 tribes of Israel, right? And these are Joseph's brothers. So the future of God's chosen people, the Hebrews, the Israelites, the Jews, is in, their fate is in the hands of Joseph. But Joseph realizes that this line that God had promised that Jesus was going to come through one day, this line is in my hands. And they would have died if God didn't send me here. And now I've got the power to preserve them. I've got the power to save them. So this is a huge roundabout way. This is how God gives grace to the entire nation of Israel. They would have been dead. Then Joseph delivers them. They go on to be the 12 tribes. And then Jesus ends up coming through the line of the Jews. And we all get saved. So if God didn't put Joseph through this, you and I wouldn't be here this Sunday because Jesus wouldn't have come through the line that God had promised he was going to come through. But he says, so that I may keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me. Do not tarry. Joseph just essentially says, Come to me. <coughs> Come to me. I'll give you grace. Come to me, and you will get the refuge. You will get the rest that you've been longing for. Come to me, and you'll get the refuge that you actually need. So we see the refuge of grace. It's protection. It's not just gentle and dealing with us, but when grace is in action, it's 
a refuge for us. Because God is the one who holds up the walls and the boundaries and the protection. Imagine the, the richest and the most powerful person in the world. Get that, whoever that is, or if you just want to make one up. The richest, most powerful person in the world. If they are your enemy, you're sunk, right? If they're your enemy, you're sunk. Because if they want to take you out, if they want to take everything from you, they can. But if they're your friend, you're hopeful. Because if they want to take care of you, if they want to provide for you, they can. They've got the ultimate power. They've got ultimate resources. And so herein lies the story of Joseph and his brothers. Joseph is the second most powerful man in the world, next to Pharaoh. And Joseph has all of this power, all of this wealth, and his brothers are in a lowly state. He owed them destruction. I mean, if you just want to say an eye for an eye, he owed them destruction, or at least slavery. But he gives them refuge. Joseph could have been their biggest enemy, or he can also be their greatest ally and their greatest comforter, their greatest provider, and that's what he becomes. I will use all of my wealth and all of my power to protect you, to be a refuge for you. Herein lies the same story of Jesus and us. Jesus is a terrible enemy to have. Anybody say amen to that? Amen. You don't want to be against this guy. I mean, he's God. He controls everything. People come to arrest him. I love this scene in the Bible. People come to arrest him. A big mob comes. Jesus says, who are you looking for? They say, Jesus was of Nazareth. And he says, I am. And everyone falls down. Just like, <laughs> everyone falls to the ground. Then they get up, and Jesus says, who is it you're looking for? He is Nazareth. <laughs> and he, again, he says, I am, then he goes with him. Jesus is never out of control. Jesus is always in control. Jesus proved that many times. There's a storm on the sea. He's sleeping on a cushion in the bottom of the boat. He's not caring. His disciples wake him up. Do you not care that we're perishing? He says, where's your faith? Peace be still. He says the waters are dead calm. You don't want to be against this dude. Jesus is the greatest enemy you could have. Jesus, in the end, Jesus wins. I mean, it may seem like, I don't know, it's a big struggle, like Satan, Jesus, people, Jesus. Jesus wins. Every time. And Jesus wins in the end. So Jesus is the worst enemy to have because, honestly, but we've all made him our enemy through our sin. So we're in the same position that Joseph's brothers were in with him. The most powerful, the most resourceful person in the universe, <laughs> I've made my enemy. But what does Jesus do to us? Jesus says things like this. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. The ultimate one in the universe that we have divinely offended, that we have spit in the face of, that we have constantly said, no, I will not do it like you have said. I will do it like I want. I am king. You are not. The one who owes us death and destruction comes to us and says, just like Joseph, come near to me. Come down to me. I'll give you rest. This is grace. This is the refuge of grace. And this, I want this to be freeing. And I know many of you have heard this idea that grace is this refuge or shelter that Jesus says, come to me, you can rest. I know you, many of you have heard it a hundred times. But if you're anything like me, you need to hear it 101 times, and 102 times, and 103 times, and a million times. Jesus didn't come to you and say, do more, try harder. Jesus comes to you and says, it is finished. Come and rest. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Yeah, he does have a yoke. He does have a burden. And we do 
follow Jesus. We are obedient to Jesus, but the reason the burden is light and he is so gentle and such a refuge for us is because in the end, it is finished. The work needed to be done for our eternal salvation, for our redemption, for our adoption, that's already done. But Jesus says, it is finished. Come and rest. Yeah, get to work, but it's restful work. You don't have to justify yourself. You don't have to worry if I'm pleased with you or not. I am. Because I'm the reason God is pleased with you. Some of you, you you so desperately need to be freed from do more, try harder. Not that you need to do less or try less hard, but you need to be freed from that being the banner that's over your life. You need to know Jesus says, it is finished. Come and rest. There's nothing you can do to make yourself more acceptable to me. I've done it. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. He says, come and you'll find rest for your soul. Some of you are desperately in need of rest, of that deep rest, of that rest that's so deep because you know Jesus has finished your work. You know you're counted righteous because Jesus was righteous for you. You know you're forgiven because Jesus paid your price on the cross. You know you're adopted into the family of God because Jesus resurrected and adopted you into the family, giving you that forgiveness and favor. You need that deep, deep rest so that no matter what you're doing, no matter how busy you are, no matter how many things are on your to-do list, you're still resting because you know in the end it's finished. You need to realize that grace is a refuge. One of my favorite authors and Bible teachers is a guy with a really cool name called uh, Tolian Shavijan. Say that five times fast, Tolian Shavijan. It's Billy Graham's grandson. He's a cool dude. He's in Florida, but he says these really profound things, and God's given him a gift to say things in like one sentence that just like punch you in the soul with grace. Tolian repeatedly just keeps saying this thing. He says, Jesus says, it is finished. What are you going to do now that you don't have to do anything? That's the refuge of grace. Nothing is lacking for God to be 100% pleased with you. If you're in Christ, he is. God will never love you anymore and will never love you any less. He can't love you anymore. He loves you fully. And he's promised to never love you any less because he loves you based on what Jesus has done for you. So what are you going to do? Now that you don't have to do anything. That's refuge. That's rest. That's come to me and rest. The same Jesus who says, come to me and rest and find find shelter, find safety, find this rest you're longing for, is the same Jesus that that rest is so deep that he says, pick up your cross and follow me. He says, die to yourself. The reason this works is because Yeah, we work hard. Yeah, we tell people the gospel. Yeah, we repent of sin. Yeah, we walk in holiness and we continually repent and we pray for God to make us more like Jesus. But all the while doing all of those things, there's this deep rest that Jesus says, remember though, it's done. You're not doing this so that I'll be pleased with you. You, You're doing this just out of joyful response to my finished work. Just like Joseph responds with his brothers and saying, Come to me. Jesus responds to you in your sin and says, come to me and rest. You'll find refuge. The fourth thing that we see in this text is the power of grace. John Piper says this frequently, but I love it. He says, grace is not just pardon. Grace is power. Grace is not just pardon. It's not just forgiveness. It's also power. Read, read the end of this text with me. Verses 12 through 15. It says, And now your eyes see, and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see. That is my, it is my mouth that speaks to you. You must tell my father of all my honor in Egypt and all of that you've seen. Hurry and bring my father down here. Then he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept. And Benjamin wept upon his neck. And he kissed all of his brothers and wept upon them. After that, his brothers talked with him. If you weren't here last week, maybe you still remember the story of Joseph, but if you were here, do you remember the Joseph of Genesis 37? 
spoiled, rotten. His dad loves him. He's got a coat. He shows off. He has these dreams. He goes and tells all of his brothers these dreams that you're going to bow down to me and worship me. What's up? It says that Joseph brought a bad report about his brothers, and that word means a misleading report. So Joseph's already the most loved in his family. His dad spoils him, loves him more than his brothers. But then he brings a bad report saying, oh, yeah, they were doing this. And he was lying about it so that his dad would hate his brothers and he would love him even more. Joseph has two dreams that say that his whole family's going to bow down to him. He goes straight to his older brothers and tells them, this guy's a tool. I was talking to my mom about this yesterday. I was like, Joseph was a huge tool. She was like, well, yeah, but you were like that when you were a kid. I was like, I know. I'm a huge tool as well. She's like, you would brag about stuff. I was like, I know. I'm not saying I didn't. I was probably more of a tool than Joseph. I'm just thankful that my older sisters didn't throw me into a pit and sell me into slavery. They would have if they could have. So what happened to Joseph? You see what he's doing? He falls on his brothers and starts weeping. Like, he's crying tears of joy. He's celebrating. My brothers are alive. All of this stuff happened, but I'm able to save them and deliver them. And he falls on their neck. He's kissing them. They're hugging. And then they they're finally realize, like, he really has given us grace. And they kind of take that step of they even start talking with him. What happened to Joseph? Did God come to Joseph and say, Joseph, you are ridiculous. Everything you've got is a gift of my grace. Quit thinking that it's because you're so awesome. It's not. You're an idiot. You're wicked. You're sinful. Change. And then Joseph's like, oh, yeah. And he starts giving grace to people. No. God showed Joseph grace. He didn't come to him and stab him. He came to him and showed him grace and delivered him and kept delivering from things. And this is how grace works. Grace changes us. When God shows us grace, that radically changes our hearts. The reason that God doesn't come to Joseph, the reason that Jesus doesn't come to us and say, you need to change, is because that doesn't work. That's the law. The law, do more, try harder. It exposes the, the fact that we need to change, but it's powerless to affect any change in our hearts. Yeah, the law reveals that I'm bad. I need to change. I'm wicked. What do I do? But just saying, you're doing this wrong, you need to stop, and you need to start doing this right, that's able for us to go, okay, I agree. But it doesn't give the power, it doesn't give the desire to actually change. See, the world has it wrong. The world thinks that law changes. And sadly, a lot of people in the church think that law changes. That's why when you go to youth group, typically, they talk about sex, they talk about drugs, they talk about alcohol, they talk about, you know, all this just moral stuff. This is what you should do. This is what you should do. This is what you should not do. And they wonder why our teenagers are more wicked than they've ever been. Because law doesn't change anyone. This is what you should do, reveals we should do it, but that's it. How many of you, you've heard someone that maybe called you to repentance or they said, man, this is way off, you need to change this, and you go, it's easier said than done, or I want to, I'm trying. Do more, try harder has never changed anyone. C.S. Lewis says it great, he says, men cannot be made good by law can't. It's the grace of God that changes us. Grace is powerful. Look at Joseph. Joseph didn't get bloodied up and just tell him, you're evil, you need to stop, you need to be good. And he goes, yay, I'm good. No, he was radically changed in a deep level to where he starts showing grace to other people because God showed him grace. It's the same for you and it's the same for me. It's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. It's the grace of God that impacts us on such a deep level that we actually start desiring to change. We desire to repent. It's not the fear of God that leads to repentance. It's the kindness. It's the grace. It's seeing that it is finished. Many people in the church are scared that if you talk about the fact that 
If I say things to you like, it is finished, what are you going to do now that you don't have to do anything? Many pastors will be like, oh, no, 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 you can't say that. They're going to go do whatever they want. Like, yeah, you're right. They're going to go do whatever they want, and they're going to want to follow Jesus. Because Jesus, when you see his grace, you fall at his feet and say, command me. What do you want me to do? You need to know that if you want to change, you need grace. If you want to change, you need to focus more on Jesus and who he is and what he's done and how he is the only son of the Father, that in him is grace and truth. And in his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. The gospel changes you. The gospel will keep changing you. The good news of God's grace is what's going to change your heart on a deep level, not just looking at what you should do. If you want to change, the Sermon on the Mount is the worst place to go. Because it's going to show you, this is what you should be doing. And you're going to go, all right, I'm going to do it. It doesn't work. If anything, it will change a little bit on the outside, but only the gospel is going to change you. If you want to be changed, go read the first half of the book of Ephesians. That talks nothing about you other than what you've received from God by grace. That's what will change you. The Sermon on the Mount will just leave you despairing because you'll go, this is what I should be doing. And if you're honest, you go, but I'm not doing it well at all, ever. I want to go. It didn't work. It's grace that changes Joseph, and it's grace that changes us. Only the gospel, the good news that it is finished, will change. Only when we realize we're more wicked than we ever realized, and at the same time more loved than we ever dared to hope, then will we we start to think differently. Only then will we start to be like, I want to change. Not just I should change, I want to. Jesus is that awesome. Jesus is that valuable. So what do we take away from this? Number one, we take away this. Those who have experienced grace celebrate grace. You see Joseph, what he's doing? He's experienced the grace And he's giving grace to his brothers, and then they just start crying. How many of you have had moments like that? Some of you guys are like, oh, no, let them cry. Whatever, you've cried. (laughs) You've had moments that are so profoundly moving, are such an experience of really how bad you are and how loved you are in Jesus, and it's just moved you to tears. There's nothing to do. It's tears of joy. And you're almost laughing as you're crying, but it's just, that's what happens. That's an emotional overflow. We've had an experience, and God is being, just dumping his love and grace and the reality of the gospel into our hearts, and there's nothing to do but weep. That's a celebration of grace. When we sing every Sunday, and we stand up, and we raise our hands, and we lift our voices singing the great truths of the gospel, that's a celebration of grace. When we take the Lord's Supper weekly, remembering Jesus' body that was broken for us, his blood that was spilled for us, that's a celebration of grace. When we give financially to fuel the mission of the church, to see more people reached and more churches planted, that's a celebration of grace. When we follow Jesus and we repent of our sin and we look to Jesus and say, what does Jesus say what I should do? I'm going to do that. Not out of a do more, try harder mentality, but out of a, it is finished, I want to do, since I don't have to do anything, the best thing is following him. What does he want me to do? Walking in holiness is a celebration of grace. Being baptized after you come to faith in Jesus, that's a celebration of grace. You know, baptism is a celebration. It's not a hot tub party. It's not something weird that we put in churches and it's like, oh, people are getting dumb. Baptism is a vivid picture of Jesus' life, death, burial and resurrection that I believe in Jesus. Jesus has saved me. I want everyone to know and I want to follow him in obedience and be baptized. Baptism is a celebration of grace. Telling the gospel to other people in your home, in your neighborhood, in your work, in your school, your family, over social media, whatever. Making the gospel known, that's a celebration of grace. And people that have experienced grace celebrate grace. We're not just thankful for it and like, oh man, yeah, I'm glad that I don't go to hell. That's cool. Let's go. We celebrate. That's why we get together and sing and we all look forward and there's people that stand up here. This is weird, 
I mean, really, without Jesus, this, what we do is weird. I stand up here and preach to you for an hour every week, and you sit there with your Bibles open, and then we stand and we sing, and we take bread and juice or wine, and we give money, and we just all stand forward and sing. This is completely creepy unless Jesus is alive, but he is. And we do this every week to celebrate grace. The second thing we see is that those who have experienced grace celebrate grace by repenting and following Jesus. See, this, this is really hard to say. It's probably even harder to hear. But I'm your pastor, and I love you, and you've got to deal with this stuff. If you say your faith is in Jesus, Jesus is your Savior, Jesus is your King, and you're not trying to obey Him, He's not. You're just faking it. You've got to know that. I don't want anyone to just go through and thinking, I've come to a, you know, a mental understanding of the gospel. I get that I'm a sinner. I get that Jesus died for me. Yeah, I'm a Christian. It's not up here, man. It's when it moves into your heart and you are gripped by the fact that Jesus became my substitute. Jesus is my resurrected Savior. Jesus is not just my Savior. Jesus is my King. If you're not trying to follow Jesus, if you're not trying to obey, you can be sure you haven't met him. You haven't. I'm not saying unless you are pristine and you've cleaned up and you've, you've never sinned. No, 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 no. But unless you're seeking to follow Jesus, you can be sure that you're not following him. You're, you're faking. I don't want any of you to fake it. I want all of you to think seriously, is my faith in Jesus? The evidence will be you desire to follow Jesus. And you're going to fail every day. But your desire, and you're trying, and you want to obey him. It's those who experience grace celebrate it by repenting of their sin and following Jesus every day. Third thing we see is that those who experience grace celebrate grace by giving grace to others. Look at Joseph and how he responds. He gives grace to his brothers because God had given him grace. That's a way that you celebrate grace. It's to look for opportunities. Men, in your marriage, look for opportunities to give your wife something she doesn't deserve. Look for those opportunities when your wife is really rude or mean or whatever and be kind and be forgiving and do something great in return for it. That's what grace is. Parents. When your kid gets a spanking, bring him into the room and spank yourself. I dare you to try that. <laughs> Tell them, son or daughter, you've disobeyed me and someone's got to pay the price. Is that not a gospel presentation right there to your kids? <coughs> spank yourself. <laughs> you get to watch me hit myself and you don't have to be spanked. Sounds weird, but that's the good news of the gospel. That's a picture of it. Wives. Give grace to your husbands. We don't deserve it, ever. And you're going to have plenty of opportunities to give us grace because we're always going to do stupid things and inconsiderate things and rude things because we're stupid. So wives, give grace to your husbands. Look for opportunities to not just forgive, but forgive and show favor. That will turn your relationship on, on its head. Friends, look for opportunities to show grace to your friends. Look for opportunities to show grace to the people you work with. Forgiveness plus favor. Because those of us who've experienced it, we want to celebrate it by giving it to others. This shouldn't just be something that's like, yeah, I should give grace. We should be excited about this. I can't wait to be able to give someone grace. I can't wait to, in a small way, treat someone how Jesus has treated me. I can't wait to put others before myself. This is a picture of the gospel. And if that's not a segue into telling them, you know what, this is what Jesus has done for me. I know it doesn't make sense at all. But this is what Jesus has done for me. Can I tell you about Jesus? He's really great. So those who've experienced grace, celebrate grace. 
Those who have experienced grace celebrate grace by repenting and following Jesus and by giving grace to others. And lastly, here's the big thing with grace. To receive God's grace, all you need is this. Need. All you need is need. All you need is to understand that you got nothing. All you need is to understand on a, in a deep way, on the level of your heart, that I desperately need Jesus grace. That's what it takes. That's all you need. That kind of, Tim Keller says this really well, he says that kind of spiritual humility is really hard to come by. That's why so many people reject the gospel. Because the gospel, the first thing says, you've got to accept the fact that you are completely hopeless on your own. That you deserve hell, wrath, and judgment. But Jesus has satisfied everything for you. Come to him. You just need to come. You just need to trust him. You need to give up trying to justify yourself. You need to set your hope on Jesus. And turn from setting your hopes on the fleeting pleasures of sin. Start banking on Jesus and who he is and what he's done. For the gospel, all you need is need. And for some of you, that's too much to ask. But I pray that it wouldn't be. I pray that you would be freed from thinking that to receive God's grace, I need to. Wait, the blank is, I need to need. It's free. Jesus says in Mark chapter 2, I have not come for the healthy. What he's saying is, I've not come for those who think they're healthy. He says, I've come for the sick. He says, the healthy have no, de- no need of a physician, but the sick do. That's who I've come for. He says, I've not come to call the righteous. I've come to call the sinners to repentance. So I've got a few questions for you as we close. This is our final week in Genesis, so these are the final questions that I ask for you for the whole book. And Bo's going to come up and play here in a few minutes, and I'm going to ask these, and I want you to just think about them, and would you be honest with yourself? And the answer is this. <clears throat> Don't budge on just skipping over these and be like, yeah, 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 yeah. Don't do that. Do you see your great need? Do you see that you have a great need for Jesus and his grace. Not just to save you, to forgive you, but to constantly save you and deliver you from the destructive things in your life and to keep delivering you from sin and changing you to be more like him. Do you see your great need that you are sick and you need the great physician? Do you see that? Do you also see that Jesus is the great physician? That Jesus was willing to die for you. Jesus didn't go to the cross begrudgingly. It was tough and he was sweating drops of blood and he said, God, not yours, not my will, but yours be done. I'm going. Jesus was willing to die for you. He was willing to pay the price to give you what you need. Have you celebrated or are you celebrating the grace of Jesus? Is your faith in Jesus? Have you been baptized since coming to faith in Jesus as an outward expression of an inward faith? Have you been baptized celebrating that Jesus has saved you? Are you celebrating it through the Lord's Supper and through sacrificially giving to fuel the mission of the church and through singing and not just staying there with your hands in your pockets, being scared that people are going to think you're a charismaniac and you have snakes? Are you celebrating? Are you celebrating every day in your life? Are you celebrating the grace of Jesus by repenting and following him? And are you celebrating grace by giving grace to others? Do you see your need? Do you see that Jesus willingly met that need for you? Are you celebrating grace? Are you celebrating it by repenting and following him and by giving grace to others? May God use those questions to make you think. 
And may it lead you not to just look into yourself, but lead you to look up to Jesus. Who says, it is finished. What are you going to do now that you don't have to do anything? Let's pray.